Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to continue our look at comics book. We're up to number four. And uh, this is a very interesting issue because this comic is now published by Kitchen Sink Enterprises. Uh, Marvel published the first three. The sales weren't very good. They didn't want to give it a chance. And luckily... They sold the rights to everything that uh, Kitchen had collected for four and five. They sold the rights back to Kitchen. So Dennis Kitchen could publish it under his publishing house, which is really nice because there's two continuing stories that would have been left dangling. And there's a lot of great stuff that he collected for these last two issues. We never would have seen them. Well, we probably would have. They would have reverted to the creators. And uh, But then again, I, it seems supposedly... Marvel first told Dennis Kitchen that people, the artists, would be able to keep their, uh, you know, trademark and copyrights to the comics. But then I read a lot of things that claim that, no, Marvel was claiming that they owned all these comics, just like the guy who draws Spider-Man. So I think that's why Dennis Kitchen in the editorial seems relieved when Marvel let him, you know, take these stories. They could have maybe... Tried to just say, no, we own these stories. We paid for them. They're ours forever, you know. So I don't know exactly how it works. But uh, it's not much different. Uh, you'd think now that it, it's not under the HES of Marvel that maybe they could get crazier. But this is all the stuff that was collected for number four anyway. And Dennis Kitchen assumed it was going to be published by Marvel. So it's still pretty clean, you know, pretty tame underground stuff. We start off with a cover by Leslie Carbaja. I, really, I don't take this cover. I get what they're trying to do here. Um, obviously, uh, Leslie Carbasha loves the old Fleischer cartoons, trying to duplicate that style. But uh, it's just not that appealing to me. Just uh, not my uh, not my meat. So here's the editorial by Dennis Kitchen. Uh, basically, there's been a year hiatus. Uh, doing the negotiations with Marvel took about a year for him to rest these comics back from Marvel. We got the contents page. I like that now that they actually have a real contents page. Instead of just saying art is this issue and you got to figure it out. This is uh, telling you all the stories and who uh, drew what. Though I do miss the little Dennis Kitchen illustrations that were on every uh, contents page. We got some more letters. Harvey Kurtzman writes in. Gives a big thumbs up. Pretty interesting. I, I like that uh, many people continue to disparage uh, uh, <laughs> Meltzer's gossip column. Almost every other letter is all like, get rid of that guy. Now, this is the weirdest thing, guys. Grim Natwick writes in. If you don't know who Grim Natwick is, is he was one of the seven old men. Uh, basically, uh, Disney... There were these seven animators that did, like, I don't know, worked there for, like, decades. Did all their classic uh, movies. And Grim Network was one of the best. And it's not like I'm a scholar of animation. I just read enough that, to know that he's the shit. And he actually wrote in. Somehow he found this underground comic. Uh, obviously, he's writing about the Fleischer story that Leslie Carbaja did in number two. And he worked at the Fleischer studio. And he basically writes in to say, like... Yeah, I don't know about, uh, the, the comic was good, but I didn't see any of this shit happen. So I don't, I don't know if it's true. It's pretty amazing, though. Pretty cool. I do like also how Dennis Kitchen chooses to publish really, like, negative letters. Some of these guys are just like, your comic's a piece of shit. <laughs> so here we have uh, Flip the Bird again by John Pound. Dr. Flip. And we looked at this in the Ground Pound video about six months ago. So I'm not going to get into it too much because I already went over the story. But just look at this super tight pound cartooning, man. John Pound's so good. He was a little too good. He didn't do many comics because he kept getting snatched up, snatched up by, you know, big graphic design projects and you know, making making money actually. 
love this panel right there. Basically, Philip the Bird's just being a sadistic asshole again, pretending to be a psychiatrist. This poor guy comes in, and Philip the Bird is basically like convincing him, convincing him to commit suicide. And then he gives him acid and purposely freaks him out. And then the guy jumps out a window. And of course, Flip doesn't give a shit. Flip is a fucking piece of shit. He's he's the protagonist. He's the worst fucking funny animal ever. We have another Skip Williamson story. Ragtime Billy meets Apple Dog. Featuring Bozo Ribobo and the dead ducky. I love that name. Bozo Ribobo. Um... If you're not my age, you might not get the reference. Uh, Richard Nixon, during the whole Watergate scandal, he kept talking about his good friend, Bobo Rezebo. That was his real name. It's almost as weird as this name. And I still can't believe that someone in the news had such a ridiculous, hilarious name as Bobo Rezobo. <laughs> it still makes me chuckle. So this is a very silly, zany story. Ragtime Billy is Skip Williamson's character, who's kind of like a right-wing patriot type guy. And uh, Bozo Rebobo is actually this monster who in other comics like eats people's heads, tears their heads off and eats them. But in this one, he just seems like a lovable goof sidekick. So Apple Dog comes to their door, this really ridiculous looking character, and Dead Ducky, his sidekick, just starts bitching about like, you don't know how miserable my life is being a sidekick to this piece of shit cartoon character. He's the worst cartoon character ever. He's a fucking moron. I mean, I love uh, the character design of App the Ragtime Billy. It's a great classic cartoon design. So this is pretty broad humor, pretty over the top, but it's kind of fun just because it is so zany. And this is strange. This is the second story in a row where the, in this one, uh, Billy convinces dead ducky to kill himself. He says, ah, oh, you're so miserable. Here, take this gun. <laughs> Maybe this is the solution. And dead ducky kills himself. And somehow it's funny. We have another Joel Beck one-pager, The Bill Bland Show. This time, uh, Bill Bland interviews W.C. Fields. This is actually kind of funny, kind of clever. I mean, I think he's just stealing old W.C. Fields lines. But it's almost like a, <laughs> a modest proposal mixed with W.C. Fields' hatred of children. He's cooking this baby. It's a, re a cooking show. And he's showing us how to cook a baby. And uh, it's pretty gnarly. He's kneading the baby and uh, putting in all this liquor, a little shot of whiskey, a dash of hard cider, a cup of absinthe. And uh, then you boil it for two hours. And he says in W.C. Fields fashion, as an aside, I'm beginning to like kids already. <laughs> and this is a pretty clever line. He finishes the strip with, kids should be cuisine and not endured. I don't know if uh, W.C. Fields actually said that or if that's a Joel Beck original line, but that's damn clever. Panthea, chapter four by Trina Robbins. So Panthea's in San Francisco. That woman who was on the plane kind of tailing her makes a phone call. She's obviously a, uh, Spying on Panthea. Panthea falls asleep in the taxi. And uh, her keen animal senses warn her that something is wrong. She says, hey, this isn't a hotel. Why are you stopping here? And it's this woman, taxi driver. And uh, they get out of the car. And apparently, it's almost like this commune of hip ladies. <laughs> They're just... You know, Trina was very into fashion. They're all very fashionable and very beautiful. And I guess they heard of Panthea and they kind of rescued her. They knew she was in danger, so they wanted to take her into the fold. So Blanca is the woman that saw her in Morocco and got on the plane to tail her. 
Uh, and so to make sure that uh, she ended up here. They're led by this woman, Mother Knight. She's the leader of this uh, commune. So all of a sudden, the plot takes this weird twist, this weird turn. That's a pretty nice Trina Robbins face right there. So she says, uh, the trouble is, honey, someone else saw you in Morocco and their plans for you ain't as groovy as ours. They're called Man Unkind and the Endangered Species. They're a rock band that uses animals as part of their act. And they're not very nice. Sometimes the animals die. So this band wants to uh, capture Panthea to be part of the act. All of a sudden, these goons break in, grab Panthea. But then uh, Blanca pulls a knife and stabs the guy, one of the guys in the arm. And then Panthea finishes off the other guy, turning into her lion form. And it actually scares the shit out of the women. They're like, that's enough. Stop it. Holy shit, what did you do to him? I guess Panthea's like, sorry, I got carried away. She just savaged this guy. So I guess uh, it's to be continued. And I think it's going to be the last chapter, next issue. Man, this is some beautiful cartooning. A Day in the Life in Sense Around by uh, Ted Richards. And a sense around, if you guys are young, it was this minor fad in the early 70s where movies, like if you saw Earthquake, the movie, they'd actually shake the seats in the theater so you felt like you were in an earthquake. They'd do all crazy shit like that. And um, so this guy uh, goes into the theater, these two guys, and it's this crazy disaster movie and the seats are rumbling. <laughs> and then shit starts falling from the ceiling. The sensor ends a little too good. And then it's rumbling more and more. There's cracks in the walls. Everyone's loving it, though. They're like, wow, these special effects are amazing. They all love it until the whole ceiling collapses on everyone, killing like most of the people in the audience. But our two heroes here escape. And uh, all they have to say is fantastic special effects, but lame and wooden dialogue. Ted Richards is never that funny to me, but I love his cartooning. It's so classic and just perfect for like funny stuff. I just wish he was funnier. I don't think I've ever read a funny Ted Richards comic ever. I like his two fools that he does with uh, Willie Murphy, but they're not that funny. They're kind of, they're cute. So now we have another period piece from Leslie Carbaja, Buddy Baker, crooner for hire. And we see this film set. They're doing a musical. And the lead is a bumbling oaf. He keeps fucking up the scenes. It turns out he's the nephew of the producer. That's how he got the job. He's just crap. So finally the director says, I don't give a shit. I'm looking for a new star. This guy's just ruining the movie. He goes in a soda shop. And the soda jerk there, this handsome young guy, Buddy, our uh, titular hero. And he spills coffee on the producer. And right then on the radio, it says, Flash, news flash. Uh, director Ernst Sumbitch is seeking a new juvenile lead for his musical noun production. I'm sorry, he's the director. That's, uh, that's Ernst Sumbitch. So, of course, Buddy doesn't know this. So, Buddy just runs off to go to the audition. And, of course, Ernst is just like, what the fuck? I thought you were going to give me a sponge to wipe myself off. So, he goes to the audition and he nails it. Because look at him. He's just this total pretty boy. I guess he, he sings like an angel. So, then he says, you got the job, kid. Let's go meet the director. Ernst, some bitch. And, of course, that's the gag. We, uh... Buddy's just about to walk in the door and meet the director. And, of course, uh, we, we just have to use our imagination to see what happens. This is really weird here. Because it's not even trying to be funny, really. Buddy Baker's Health and Beauty Hints. As if this was a article from, like, Screen... Silver Screen Magazine from 1932 or something. 
But man, guys, look at this lettering here. Um, I don't know if we talked about this last time, but Leslie Carbaja, uh, after you know his underground comics career, he went on to be a, like a really big wig in the font world. He created a whole bunch of fonts. He made his a huge career out of it. So we always had that amazing graphic design sense. But this lettering is just gorgeous. I know that's a weird compliment because this is a really boring article. It's literally just Buddy Break Baker telling us how we keep so pretty. <laughs> He's, you know, sounds like a woman the way he talks about using eyeliner and lipstick. But it's not that funny. It's just, but it's very written like um, perfectly as if it was one of those articles. Speaking of two fools, here we have another one by Willie Murphy and Ted Richards. The two fools are stuck on a desert island. But man, this is the best desert island ever. It seems like shit's washing up on shore all the time. So these guys have all this cool shit. Pirate treasure chests wash up on shore with all this stuff. They got cigars. They got booze. And, uh... This mannequin washes up, this lady mannequin. And one of the two fools puts a wig on her and starts whining and dining her, <laughs> pretending she's a real woman. The other guy comes up and explains to him. He says, dude, what are you doing? This isn't a woman. It's just a fucking mannequin. You're losing it. As he walks away, kind of realizing like, oh, he's right, man. But then the guy sits down and takes over the date. He just wanted to have the mannequin to himself. But then I guess the mannequin isn't uh, responding, is ignoring him. So he starts strangling the mannequin. The skinny fool wrests the mannequin away from him and then continues his candle lit dinner with her. So very odd. But man, the drawing in this, I love this shit. This um, issue's profile is about Flippy Skippy Will Williamson. They talk a lot about his uh, fanzine days, making his like uh, Harvey Kurtzman inspired fanzines. This is a fun story, The Two-Timer by Sharon Rudall. I always like Sharon Rudall stuff. It's never great, but it's always kind of interesting. And this is about how she was part of this woman's group back in the early 70s. And there was this one guy who lived in the communal house and he was this total player. And he was just, every night he had a different girlfriend. Girls were calling up all the time. And I guess this is autobio, so Sharon Rudall was roommates with Trina Robbins. So we get to see Trina Robbins here. She draws her very cute. I always hear that Trina Robbins is incredibly cute when she was younger. All the underground cartoons talk about that. So basically this uh, Lothario is dating like two women in the group. Neither of them know about it though, about the other one. And finally Sharon Rudolph can't take it anymore. She's like, I don't know if it's my place, but I got to let these girls, they got to know that this guy's, you know, sleeping with both of them. And during a meeting, she tells them. And both the women embrace and say, oh, I was such a fool. He was a lousy lover anyway. I'd much rather have you as a friend than him as a boyfriend. But then the next meeting, they kick Sharon out. And <laughs> she says, uh, your behavior was manlike. You're aggressive and ambitious. Women should give love, not criticism. And then... Uh, one of the, the women who's dating Ted, that's his name, she still says, well, anyway, I still think Ted's great. He took me on Sunday and Armanita Tuesday. He'll just, he'll just have to choose between us. So all of a sudden, she's the bad guy and Ted is fine. <laughs> oh, that's so annoying. And so Sharon basically just makes another woman's group. She's like, fuck this group. I'll form my own uh, woman's group. Of course, Ted skips town without paying his phone bill. He seems like a real weaselly jerk. Here we have short shrift, the little strips. We got a Trina Robbins strip. We got another Basil Wolverton. Just more of his <laughs> nut job humor. 
So silly, but just great art. We have a Tim Boxall strip. Very odd. And we have a Sharon Rudolph strip. Here we have a half pager from Gary Halgren. This is his uh, first appearance in comics book. And this is called Man of the World. And it's about male chauvinist pigs. It's not that funny. This is weird. This article about suburban Hoovervilles. Um, well, it's just an introduction to the center spread. And it's basically talk, the Hoovervilles were those uh, shanty towns during the Depression in the 30s. And this writer is uh, surmising that with the recession in the 70s, we'll see suburban Hoovervilles one day. And this is it. This is the interpretation of this. This is drawn by Peter Loft, we saw last issue. Still never really saw the guy before. This is really nice. Really nice drawing. It almost reminds me of, like, it's not nearly as good, but it kind of reminds me of Jeff Darrow. Just how much little, all this business going on. Of course, Jeff Darrow would have added like 50 more people on every street and so much more shit. The thing I don't understand this about this is this doesn't look like suburbia. <laughs> this looks like a small city. I grew up in suburbia. There was nothing. There were two-story buildings. It was just houses, tract houses. There was a few stores here and there. But this almost looks like a small city, you know, with the theater. So I don't get it. And uh, it just shows all these people on the dole, living in tent cities, uh, getting into political uh, kind of a conflict. Kind of weird. Very weird idea. Uh, this is nice. Born Again by Kim Deitch. This is a reprint from a 1972 comic. So this is kind of old. It was like four years old when this was printed. So this guy, Silk Miller, he's a cheap hooligan, 15 minutes away from death. He's on death's row. And uh, he's not worried, though, because I guess a week ago, the, his neighbor on death row, Cosmo LaVey, he, uh, he was in jail for gruesome ritualistic killings. He was into the occult. And he said, you know, he was all happy, even though he was about to die. And Silk said, how could you be so upbeat? You're going to die tomorrow. And he says, oh, don't worry about me. I won't be here too much longer. I, uh, I have this little, like, saying, upe ote oto. And, uh, and basically I'll be reincarnated. But here, you should try this, the Upe Ote Oto. Not only will you be reincarnated, you'll be famous. So you just have to keep repeating this phrase. And the next morning, before they could take him to the electric ch chair, Cosmo was found dead. So they're like, ah, damn it, we can't kill him in the chair. So uh, Silk says, wow, Cosmo was right. He didn't burn. And he really starts saying, ope, ote, oto in earnest. He's really confident that uh, it works. So as he's heading to the electric chair, he's chanting ope, ote, oto. And, uh, but he dies. So we'll see what happens in a second. Meanwhile, Cosmo is just about to get uh, his autopsy. And these two guys come in and say, hey, we want the body. We're claiming the body. It's his cohorts. And they put him in the car. And Cosmo isn't dead. He basically, he was in a self-induced cataleptic trance, which mimics death. So he tricked them. He changes his name to Dr. C.L. Richardson and just becomes this quack doctor. 
learning as he went along. <laughs> so a lot of patients die at his watch. But uh, it doesn't matter. You win some, you lose some. He keeps making money, he becomes very rich. At his old age, he gets really into horticulture and uh, organic gardening. One day he's putzing around his garden and he pulls out this potato, unlike any he'd ever seen. And that's it. It's got, almost looks like it has arms and legs. And on the potato skin, it's the frozen likeness of Silk Miller. And uh, he shows the potato, Silk the potato, the headline. He says, look, I was right. You're alive and you're famous. Dr. Seal Richardson and his freak potato take top honors at State Fair. <laughs> so dumb, but really fucking fun. This next one's called Tom Turkey and the Candy Colored Tangerine Flake Streamline Baby. So we see this guy, Tom. He's a, kind of a doofus. He hears these uh, two fine mamas uh, ooing and eyeing over this guy in a cool sports car. So he's like, I got to get me a, a nice car. Doesn't have a lot of money, so he goes to the used car lot. He basically wants a chick magnet. And uh, he takes buys this lemon. It's so obviously a bad car, but he doesn't care. He just really wants to impress the ladies. And he pulls up to the same woman from before. And he says, hey, girls, like a spin in a real car. And his car is so, like, you know, crappy. It's shooting out smoke and stuff. So the women are like, oh, a polluter. Gas hogs are so uncool. And then in the last panel, he uh, puts it up for sale, the car. So this is Gary Halgren, too. I wonder if this is old Gary Halgren. I wouldn't have guessed it's Gary Halgren. It's pretty fun cartoony, though. I kind of like it. But it's not up to his normal stuff. Now we have All Things Green and Growing. Story by Mal Warwick and art by Lee Morris. I don't know who Mal Warwick is, except for the fact that I know that he wrote, or th she, wrote a lot of stories for Lee Morris. There's a bunch of uh, ground-level comics, um, undergrounds with uh, the Warwick Morris uh, byline. So this is weird. This is almost like a something that could be in creepier eerie. We see this super rich guy. I guess he adopts these two kids from the foster home. And he says, hold on to your hats, kids. This may freak you out. But I have the largest botanical collection in the world. And we see these kind of like freakishly huge plants. And apparently he has this uh, device. He figured out a way where you can talk to the plants with this headpiece, earpiece. So a lot of the plants are um, are car carnivorous. There, we see this uh, the assistant uh, feeding a rat to one of the plants. So that night they're relaxing, the foster kids. I guess they're a couple. And they hear a sound. And it looks like the assistant, she got too close to one of the carnivorous plants and she's being eaten. And basically this old man, I guess he he wanted to feed these guys to his plants. That's why he adopted them. Some of this art looks really neat to me. I could picture this being in a Charlton comic, like some weird artist. That's a great face right there. There's some nice uh, work in here. So one of the carnivorous plants grabs uh, the boy. And he says, listen to Sandra, the woman. He says, uh, the girl, he says, listen to its terrible pleasure. So he gives her the headset. So he says, Sandra, you'll die if you try to escape. Please stay. Help me with my work. And then all of a sudden, one of the carnivorous plants grabs the old man. And we see that Sandra is talking to the plant. 
She says, that evil old man, the way he tried to starve you, it's just like you was a kid in the orphanage. But now you've got a friend and I'm going to give you everything you want. <laughs> very weird. This is very odd. This is a very early Harvey Pekar story. Famous Street Fights, A True Life Adventure, The Champ, a tale from the 1950s. Pekar writes it and Robert Armstrong draws it. I really like this Robert Armstrong cartooning. Just really, he's just got this certain style. So I guess there's this guy, uh, Francis Pellegrin. And uh, they're just these uh, three Italian teenagers always causing trouble. They always talk with like a weird dialect, weird slang. And they're always hanging out in the soda shop. The guy who works there, his name is Nazir DiCillo. De Maybe it's DiCillo. And he hates these dumb kids. And uh, Francis is kind of ballsy. He's just like, mind your own business, fat boy. Now this is ballsy because his uh, uncle, I believe, is like a mob guy. Oh, his father is a mafioso. So nobody fucks with him, but Francis doesn't care. So uh, DeSillo says, if I catch you on the streets, I'll kill you. So Francis basically tells everyone, he says, guys, meet me behind the soda shop. DeSillo's going to get off at a certain time. And uh, he'll have to put his money where his mouth is. And DeSillo runs at him, <clears throat> attacks him. And Francis makes short work of him. And then when he's down, he kicks him in the head a few times. The mafia guys show up and they calm him down. They don't hurt him. They figure it was a clean fight, you know. But uh, they just don't want it to escalate further. But the main reason is, is because uh, Carmine, the, the mafia boss, the father... Oh, I'm sorry. Carmine is a local boxer who compliments him and says, hey, maybe you should come down to the gym. So he becomes a huge hero. Girls who never talk to him are like inviting him to parties. And now he becomes a total, uh, it goes to his head. He starts uh, picking on kids just because they're nerds. Francis takes over the world. I am the king. Nobody plays with me. There's this weird thing Harvey Pickard does in this. Every time it's A-Y, he makes it A-E, like the connected A-E, uh, like phonetics. It's kind of dumb and annoying. I just wanted to point that out because it's very odd. At first, I just thought there were words I didn't know. I was like, what? I'm like, oh, he's just, it's like some pretentious bullshit or something. I don't know. So like most Harvey Pickard stories, you know, it's, it doesn't have like a story arc. It's just a, like I, I turned the page after this panel. It was like, oh, what's going to happen next? It's like nothing. <laughs> it's just a little observation of this kid in the 50s. So uh, this is You Are What You Eat. And I've never seen this guy before, but man, this guy's got chops. Kind of reminds me of like a Tom Sutton when Tom Sutton draws really tight. And, uh, this woman runs into the outhouse to take a shit. And then the, I guess there's another seat in the outhouse. And all of a sudden this monster crawls out. A bunch of monsters. They're all like Hieronymus Bosch creatures. And they all walk out of the outhouse. <laughs> That's a pretty great panel. One of them looks like uh, Spiro Agnew. And then the woman says, no more junk food for me. So this guy's uh, Jay Rumpf. Let me see his first name. It's Jim Rumpf. Never heard of this guy. I'm pretty sure he wasn't an underground guy. He looks really slick. Like, he probably did, like, uh, you know, professional cartooning, uh, graphic design. I wouldn't mind seeing more of him, though. I mean, the gag's really dumb, but this is fun. I'm drawing all these monsters. Uh, here is, not only is it a Howard Cruz barefoot story, but it's Dolly, his girlfriend. She irks the shit out of me. 
And but it's a really odd story. Dolly recognizes the street person. She says, ah, it's all rubbers. He's feeding the pigeons. And she says, you used to be a faith healer. I know who you are. At first, she's denying it. But then he finally gives in and says, yeah, that's me. And she basically just says, after all of this, like, I guess what's supposed to be humorous banter between the two, none of it is. It's very unfunny. And uh, basically she says, with your power, will you help me get laid? I guess Barefoots isn't putting out. And so uh, the faith healer basically rings up Jesus, says, hey, could you help me out with this thing? And later on, Dolly's at home. And uh, a great Dane comes to her door. And she says, I wonder, can these Danes be as great as they say? The Dane says, hi there, Jesus sent me. So I guess she's going to fuck the great Dane. Oh, so crappy. I mean, like I've, always, I've said before, Howard Cruz has got such a good cartooning, you know, such good chops. And I hate to see him <laughs> wasted on this shit. Here's chapter four of We Fellow Travelers by Justin Green. Uh, guys, this is just getting more and more crazy. So when last we left off, Neurosis, who now is a mouth, he's looking for a doctor for his brother. And we see uh, his bro the, the brother's guardian angel keeps showing up. So Neurosis finds a, a bicycle and he rides to the quickest place he can. Uh, I'm sorry, the closest place he can. This uh, German beer hall. And it looks like there are a bunch of Nazis in there. One guy's dressed up as Hitler. And... Uh, Neurosis is like, is there a doctor in the house? And there is a doctor there. So uh, the doctor gets on the, the tandem bicycle with Neurosis and he takes him to the, uh, the Church of Profanity, the Saw Church of Profanity. They go inside and they see the caretaker. And the caretaker, t sorry, the caretaker says, ah, I already took care of your brother. But the doctor says, he just put a potato sack on it. <laughs> That's not going to cure him. He says, boil some water quick. But then the caretaker sprays air wick on the doctor. And it makes him dissolve. So I guess the doctor was a poltergeist. Because the, the caretaker, the handyman, tells us that air wick is anathema to even the feistiest of poltergeists. So I guess his bag was real because the bag doesn't disappear. So uh, he opens up the bag and it looks like this guy was just a quack. There's, all this, uh, uh, there's a bunch of apples in there. <laughs> but then a snake jumps out. The handyman sprays the snake with air wick and the snake isn't fake. It's not a poltergeist, so it doesn't go away. This comic is so nuts. But it's amazing because it's so nuts. It's like you have no freaking clue what's going to happen. So then I guess, let me go back here. Who is this guy? I don't know who this guy is. Oh, uh, sorry, it's the brother. The snake goes slithering up the brother's pants leg. And it comes out his mouth. And by witnessing this, Neuroses, ha his eyes, he has eyes now. You know, the whole comic, they've been exes. And now he has little weird eyes. And then the handyman says, my daughter, my little girl, don't panic, darling, Papa's coming. And uh, it looks like his daughter, his stepdaughter is uh, 
having a run-in with that snake. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Ah, oh, it's crazy. So good, though. Here we have another Ted Richards strip, Ezekiel Wolf. This, uh, this was one of his big characters, E.Z. Wolf. He was in, he had his own underground comic. And once again, this is not really funny at all. But man, look at this perfect, classic, great, funny animal cartooning. This is great stuff. The gist of it is, is basically, there's the, this young girl has joined the boys' little league. I don't know. And they're playing a baseball game. And she gets a home run. But I uh, don't really see the humor in it. But I do see the beautiful cartoony in it. On the back cover we have Let's Be Happy by Steve Stiles. This is a very odd sadistic strip. I guess uh, Mr. Smile. Uh, he's hanging out with his little friend Bunky. They're uh Fishing out on Lake Tahoe. And they hear this uh, screaming, help. And it's this bunky sister. He says, don't just stand there, do something, Mr. Smile. And Mr. Smile throws the anchor at her head and <laughs> kills her. Says, you stupid shit, you killed my sister. Christ, how embarrassing, if only I could stop smiling. So it's a very typical Steve Styles type strip, uh, except for this uh, happy Mr. Happy Face. This is very odd, though. Copyright 1975 Dennis Kitchen. So I wonder, it's so funny that, like, maybe he stole all the copyrights. You know, Marvel was going to do it, so he made the deal with Marvel, and instead of giving the copyrights back to his artists, he's just like, I own them now. But I think that's the only one that says that. I don't know. Let's look at the indicia. I'm kind of curious now. So the reprinted stories from like 72 and 74, they do say like copyright the individual artists. But I wonder if it says everything else. Okay. It still says copyright magazine management. That's the Marvel company. So this is weird. I don't understand the machinations behind this, but apparently Marvel... Own the copyright on this and let Dennis Kitchen publish it? I don't know. I guess it's not important. Um, we don't really have to care about that. But there you go, guys. Comics book number four. Another pretty damn fun issue. Definitely not a thousand adult chuckles. But uh, I don't know. A, <laughs> a couple score of chuckles, maybe. But I hope you guys enjoyed looking at it. And I also wanted to apologize, guys, if my voice has been sounding funny. I, uh, in the past month, I've lost like 80% of my hearing. So I can barely hear my own voice when I talk. So I hope I'm not sounding weird. And uh, I hope I sound like my old self. I don't know. I can't really tell. But um, hope you enjoyed uh, looking at this comics book number four. And I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.